Hi, I'm John Horn. I'm using a picture of me. I was on top of Mount Liberty in New Hampshire in 2017 when I took that picture. And I'm going to talk about my most recent book, The Petersburg Regiment in the Civil War, a history of the 12th Virginia Infantry from 1859 to 1865, from John Brown's Hanging to Appomattox. The 12th Virginia was an incredibly literate regiment. It had several men who each left volumes. And I'm going to talk about the five most prolific writers in the regiment. I'm going to talk about George Bernard, who compiled and edited two books. Then I'm going to talk about Westwood Todd, who left a volume of reminiscences at the Southern Historical Collection in North Carolina. I'm going to talk about James Edward Whitehorn from Company F, who was its first sergeant and left several documents, mostly diaries, but a, a, also a letter collection. I'm going to talk about James Eldred Phillips, who left a diary and a memoir. He was from Company G. And I'm going to talk about, finally, John F. Sale, who left a letter collection and a diary. The Petersburg Regiment uh, is available for sale from Savas Beatty. It came out in 2019, and it is also available on Amazon and from Barnes & Noble. The figure on the cover is another one of the interesting soldiers of the regiment, William Crawford Smith, but uh, he's pretty much a story in himself. He, he was in Tennessee at the time the war began. He came back to enlist in Virginia, where he had come from, and he went on, he went on to become the um, last color bearer of the regiment. And he died in the Philippines as a colonel of a federal unit from Tennessee in 1899. But he's, a, he's another story. So this talk is called Five Soldiers in Search of an Historian, and it's on the five most prolific writers in the 12th Virginia Infantry, the Petersburg Regiment. It was called the Petersburg Regiment because six of its 10 companies came from Petersburg. Now the first and the most prolific of the regiment's writer was George S. Bernard. He was a lawyer in Petersburg and he began as a private in Company E. He enlisted with Company E before the war. Company E was in existence since 1859, since John Brown's raid. And he went with his company to Norfolk at the beginning of the war, and he served there for a while until he came down with typhoid fever. He received a medical discharge in September 1861. And then he started recuperating, and by February he had recovered enough to try teaching school in Greensville County, which was about uh, 30, 30 miles south of Petersburg. But within two weeks, he, he was sick of teaching school. He, he, he couldn't stand it. And also, news came of the Confederate disasters at Roanoke Island and Forts Henry and Donaldson, and Bernard decided he belonged with the Army. So he joined a company that was forming down in Greensville from men from Brunswick and Greensville counties. And one of the other men in the company was Joseph Richard Manson, who was a kinsman of Bernard. 
Manson was to become the first lieutenant of the company, and he went on to become a fairly prolific writer uh, of the regiment himself, leaving letters and articles that spanned pretty m most of the war. But he, he wasn't one of the, he was one of the second tier of writers in the regiment, because there were half a dozen other writers who left substantial amounts of literature. The company was called the Meharan Greys, and it was assigned first to Petersburg and then sent down to Norfolk. And in Norfolk, it joined the 12th Virginia Infantry, where, which was um, the regiment that the Petersburg Riflemen belonged to. That was Bernard's first company. The, co the regiment abandoned Norfolk in May, of 1862, passed through Petersburg, went on to Drury's Bluff, where it participated in the in the naval action there, of all things, then proceeded on to Richmond and to Seven Pines, where the regiment first saw action. Bernard was the third sergeant of the Meharan Grays, which were then Company I of the regiment. He wasn't uh, injured at uh, Seven Pints. He left a detailed account of that fight. Then the uh, regiment participated in the Seven Days, and he's left a detailed account of that fighting. The next campaign he participated in was the, the Maryland campaign of 1862, and he left an article on that campaign in his uh, compilation, War Talks of Confederate Veterans, which was published in 1892. At the, uh, he, he survived the Battle of Second Manassas, and then he proceeded with the regiment to the Battle of Crampton's Gap. Now, at Crampton's Gap, the 12th Virginia was part of a small detachment of con Confederate soldiers sent to block a much larger force of Federals. Let's see if the, the cursor works here. Well, the, the 12th Virginia was in the middle of the picture here and it was, with the rest of its brigade, overwhelmed by federal forces. Bernard was wounded in the leg, and one of the few illustrations that were penned uh, in War Talks of Confederate Veterans has First Lieutenant Manson, who was Bernard's kinsman, raising a white flag behind Bernard, who's here, at uh, Crampton's Gap. They were taken into custody and subsequently exchanged. Bernard, after his exchange and subsequent quarantine, he had to be quarantined because of a, an ongoing smallpox epidemic. He went on detail as a recruiting officer at Cumberland Courthouse. That's about 60 miles southwest of Richmond. And when his Crampton's Gap leg wound healed enough to permit him to go back to service in the field, he, at his own request, obtained relief from the detail and returned as a private to his original company, the Petersburg Rifleman. Now, one of the odd things about Bernard uh, seems to me always to have been the question, why wasn't he an officer? He was a lawyer, and most of the people who were highly educated in the regiment uh, became um, officers. 
he was in the Peters, he started out in the Petersburg Rifleman, which was the most highly educated company in the regiment. And many of the, the Petersburg Riflemen, 40 of them, as I counted them, went on to become officers. But he remained, he went back to service as a private. And he wrote to his father, my leaving is my own act, unadvised by any person, unadvised by any person whatsoever. And the step I take in returning to my command is only induced by a strong sense of duty, which directs me now that I feel myself fit for service to return where I belong and where ought to be thousands of others not at home or in easy berths, he wrote. He was a really steady character, and he, his writings during the war display more passion than his writings afterward. He was far more detached, and after the war, he came to the belief that the war had turned out the way it should. But while he was engaged, he was a passionate advocate of the Confederate cause. He participated in the fighting of 1863, including the Chancellorsville campaign and the Gettysburg campaign, and he left a very detailed um, article on the Gettysburg campaign. He fought through 1864 at, in the wilderness at Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, the, the fighting around Petersburg, particularly the crater. And in February 1865, he was wounded once again at the Battle of Hatcher's Run, southwest of Petersburg. He luckily it was a very, very light wound because if he'd have been seriously hurt, it would have been very difficult to write a book about the 12th Virginia Infantry. Bernard was its first historian, really. He didn't complete his history of the regiment, but his, his work is indispensable. And the Battle of uh, Hatcher's Run was a Confederate victory. The, the, conf the Confederates kept the Federals from advancing all the way to the Boydton Plank Road, which was a critical supply line running southwest from Petersburg. Bernard did not make it to Appomattox because he was on leave on furlough at the time of the fall of Petersburg. He tried to get back to his unit and almost made it to Appomattox, but, the, but General Lee had surrendered by the time uh, Bernard uh, was in reach. After the war, he taught school for a while again and then resumed the practice of law. He was elected to the state legislature and he was very active in the AP Hill United Confederate Veterans where he wrote articles and circulated them and published the, the results and compiled them into books. After he published War Talks of Confederate Veterans in 1892, he had another book ready to go in 1896, but it disappeared. Didn't show up again until 2004 in a flea market. A man bought it for $50 and sold it to the Museum of Western Virginia History for 15000 And Hampton Newsom, John Selby, and myself edited, in, edited the book into Civil War Talks, Further Reminiscences of George S. Bernard and His Fellow Veterans. 
and that was published by the University of Virginia Press in 2012. It's, it's also available for sale. Another man from the Petersburg Rifleman, Company E of the 12th Virginia Infantry, was Westwood A. Todd, another lawyer. Now, Todd was a Norfolk lawyer, and he was from Norfolk. He, he enlisted in, the, in Company A of the 12th Virginia Infantry while it was in Norfolk, and then he transferred to Company E, the Petersburg Rifleman, before the regiment left Norfolk. Todd was a, and we'll proceed to Todd here. Todd was a very genial writer and he left a memoir. And of course, memoirs tend to be more dispassionate than writings that are, originate during the conflict. And so his, uh, his, his memoir is a very cheerful, uh, genial book. It's, about, it's more than 300 pages long, 300 type pages long. He proceeded with the company through the retreat from Norfolk, and he participated in the Battle of Seven Pines as well as the the uh, Seven Days Battles, and then he went on to Second Manassas. Now, at Second Manassas, he was in a really intense firefight. The 12th Virginia, as you can see, was on the left of Mahone's Brigade here. Let's see if I can get this cursor to... Alrighty. Yeah. Well, it's, it's pretty much right in the middle of the picture. Here we go. Here's the 12th Virginia. And it was engaged against regulars at the basically last... Um, the last stage of the fight near the Henry House Hill as the Southerners attempted to cut the road uh, for that the Yankees were retreating on. The Federal regulars and the 12th Virginia, and as well as the rest of Mahone's brigade, really blasted one another. It was the bloodiest fight to date for the 12th Virginia. Uh, around 82 men were killed, wounded, or captured, and uh, about 20 of them were mortally wounded. One of the other wounded was Westwood Todd, who lost part of a finger there. And he describes hugging the ground um, during the firefight after he was wounded. He proceeded to recuperate it at the at, at Aldi, Virginia, and at the home of a local, uh, a wealthy local man, Colonel John Harrison, I recall his name was, and there's a, Todd relates a great story with um, Harrison, who took a liking to Todd. He gave him a horse and Todd would go visit people throughout the countryside, including other 12th Virginia soldiers who were recuperating in, in uh, private homes up that way. And the uh, Harrison, the uh, Todd's host, would send a, a messenger out to get Todd and say, there, there's, a, there's something important I've got to tell you. And Todd had come back and the message would be, the ice is the ice and the juleps is melting, and if we don't drink them now, they'll be ruined. After Todd had recuperated, he went back to the regiment, and he had he 
participated in the uh, fighting at Chancellorsville. But then after his wound at Second Manassas, after he'd recuperated, he got the opportunity to go on detached duty as the brigade's ordnance officer. And what Todd said was, I had no insurmountable repugnance to leaving the ranks. I suppose no man ever had who tried it well and was not thirsting for glory. And inasmuch as I had seen the elephant from the tip of his trunk to the end of his tail and was sufficiently amused therewith, he recalled, he decided to take the position as the brigade's ordnance officer. It didn't keep him out of the line of fire, though, because he was captured at Sailor's Creek on April 6, 1865. He was taken from there to Johnson's Island Prison out in Lake Erie, where he stayed until July. And it was in May, April, May, of 1865, it was quite cold out there on Johnson's Island. He, Todd reports snow out there. And he finally came home in, in June or July of 1865, and he resumed law practice in Norfolk. And he practiced law for the rest of his life. He, he died in 1886. The difference between Todd and, and Bernard coming back from service. Now, there was no, there was no stigma to Todd taking a position with the, um, in the rear, although not very far in the rear, <clears throat> because he'd already served. And there were other men who were concerned, uh, who, who started out in the rear as clerks and they, a lot of them felt compelled to, to participate in combat so that they, they didn't bear any stigma of having what's called a bomb-proof position. Now, as we can see, Todd didn't have a bomb-proof position, and he'd already served. On the other hand, there were diehards like George Bernard who came back from easy details, uh, from the easy detail, and indeed from a medical discharge. Um, but Todd had uh, comported himself honorably by he he'd gotten the red badge of courage at at Second Manassas. Then there's James Edward Eddie Whitehorn, one of my favorite characters, uh, farmer, first sergeant, Company F. Company F was. <clears throat> like the Maharan Grays, it was from Brunswick and Greensville counties, about 30 miles south of Petersburg. Brunswick, let's see, Company F. Company F was called Uge Grays. Uge is H U G E R, and it was named after the first division commander of under which the 12th Virginia served, General Uge, its commandant in <clears throat> Norfolk. Whitehorn left a lot of really good letters, and he covers the period in the garrison duty in Norfolk talking about how at the end of 1861 down in Norfolk, the guardhouse was rammed and crammed with soldiers who had been drinking too much for Christmas. He went on to serve in the, the fighting of 1862 around Richmond and in the, the campaign of uh, the Maryland campaign and also, the, the fighting in 1863. <clears throat> he was a vivid writer, and in, in his account of the, of the Gettysburg campaign, 
he writes about how on June 24th, 1863, the Petersburg Regiment and, a, and another regiment acted as wagon guards while the rest of their division crossed the Potomac. Some of the 12th soldiers relieved their boredom by building little pens out of sticks and putting into the pens the big black ants that infested the area. We had lots of fun seeing them fight. Sometimes both get would get killed, Whitehorn wrote. It was brutal, but we had to have some diversion. That passage always reminds me of the beginning of Sam Peckinpah's Wild Bunch, where the kids are pitting ants against scorpions. Whitehorn's company became involved in the fighting for the Bliss Farm at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863. Now the, the Bliss Farm is more or less in the upper center of this picture. And the, the company that Whitehorn was with was uh, driven back by the Federals after the, oh, after the, yes, here's the Bliss Farm right here. And his company retreated and it was about to counterattack when a shell burst nearby and Whitehorn was wounded in both of his legs. And he made his way back to the uh, field hospital of Wilcox's brigade, the Alabama brigade of the regiment, which was to the south of the Virginia brigade. And there he was treated for his wounds. There's another wonderful passage from his account of the Gettysburg campaign that describes how he was on a mountain in the Blue Ridge and watching a thunderstorm take place below him, watching the flashes of lightning in the distance below him. Whitehorn managed to get back to Virginia instead of falling into federal hands as a prisoner because he a friend found him a place on a wagon heading back to Virginia. And it took him until early 1864 to recover. He didn't participate in the fighting at either uh, Spotsylvania or the wilderness. He got back, he got back into the ranks around Cold Harbor because after a month of guarding the Brigade's wagon train, he returned to the ranks and he, he wrote, I have never yet, nor do I ever expect to volunteer for any dangerous service, he recalled. He had, he, he had re endured the disrespect of his immediate superior long enough and he explained, I'm not going to bootlick or humiliate myself to any officer in order to keep an easy place. The superior said I was a fool not to keep a soft place when I had one, remembered Whitehorn. But he came back to his, to the regiment and to his position as first sergeant of Company F. <clears throat> and he came back pretty much in time to get wounded again because he was at the crater and he was wounded there in the, once again in the leg. He, the, let's see, the brigade charged and the 12th was on the left because of countermarching. Usually the 12th was over on the right. Now, the casualties that the sharpshooters here suffered, they lost 96 out of 106. The, the 12th over here lost far fewer. And Whitehorn was, was wounded at the crater. He didn't make it into the into the trenches that the where the twelfth Virginia and the rest of the Confederates were slaughtering the federal 
soldiers. The Petersburg Regiment at the crater lined up pretty much this way. He was, he, Whitehorn was over here, on the left. Yes, yeah, so on the left here, Company F. So Company F probably suffered fewer casualties than the companies over on the right. The farther left anyone was in this charge, <clears throat> the less likely the person was to get wounded. Now we come to James Eldred Phillips, originally a private in Company G and finally first lieutenant of Company G. Company G was originally the Richmond Grays, and at the war's very beginning, it belonged to the first Virginia, but it was detached and sent to Norfolk to serve with the 12th Virginia. Before the war, the Richmond Grays had been at John Brown's hanging, and in their ranks was a, um, a soldier who left writings behind, who stood next to John Wilkes Booth. And John Wilkes Booth went up to John Brown's hanging with the Richmond Grays. And when the drop fell and John Brown was hanged, John Wilkes Booth got a bit squeamish and uh, said to the man next to him, I could use a drink of whiskey now. <laughs> well, that was the end of John, John Wilkes Booth's participation in the Richmond Grays, but James Eldred Phillip lasted through the war, and he was a very vivid writer as well. He was captured at Crampton's Gap like George S. Bernard. The 12th was in the middle of the formation, and it was overwhelmed by the Federals. <clears throat> Phillips left a memoir of his company. He was a tinsmith before the war, and he also left a diary. His diary began in 1864. <clears throat> and he fought at the, the wilderness where he described taking one of the wounded back to the, the field hospital, a sergeant who'd, who'd been shot in the head and had his brains running out of his head. And uh, the man died shortly afterward. <clears throat> He also fought at Spotsylvania, where his brother was killed. The Spotsylvania fight was one of the most savage fights the 12th Virginia had, one of the, one of the bloodiest, like Second Manassas or the Crater. And Phillips had one of the most interesting adventures of the, the whole regiment. He's a very compassionate man. But he, he felt bad about leaving his brother unburied and his comrades, because many of his comrades were killed at Spotsylvania as well. So he got a furlough at the end of the at the end of the year. And he went to Richmond. And at seven AM on December twenty eighth, on furlough in Richmond, Phillips boarded the Richmond Fredericksburg and Potomac for Guinea Station. Now that was 30, 40 miles north of, of Richmond. And the interesting thing there is that that railroad was running once again, even though Grant's army had crossed the railroad and torn it up. By the end of 1864, that railroad was running again. From Guinea Station, Phillips walked 12 miles to Spotsylvania Courthouse, picking up a barrel stave he carved his dead brother's name into the wood. At 3 p.m., Phillips entered the trees near where the 12th Virginia had fought the Yankees on May 12th. Soon he found his dead brother, dead brother and his comrades lying on their backs on the slope of Heath's Salient. Heath's Salient was on the eastern side of the Spotsylvania fortifications. They had on all their clothing but their hats. Storms had blown the hats away. They possessed all their equipment except their muskets, 
which details from the Confederate Ordnance Department had collected. Phillips identified his brother Bob and their fellow Richmond Grays, Sergeant Charles W. Granger, and others. <clears throat> Phillips confirmed his identification of his brother by checking his brother Bob's haversack and finding the ivy root pot pipe he had made for Bob at Chancellorsville. Phillips went back to a small home near the courthouse, borrowed a pick and shovel, then hurried back and dug a shallow grave by his brother's side. Laying Bob's corpse in the grave, Jim filled it in and put the mark board at the dead man's head. Phillips did his best to cover Granger with earth as well. Looking at the others again, Phillips knelt and prayed for them. I was alone. And you can imagine what a feeling I had come over me, he recalled. Not a soul nearby, but those dear dead men. Men I had known so long and had been in battle with many times. Later on, he wrote, I have always wished that I violated my leave of absence and remained long enough to have buried all of the dead from our regiment. Phillips went on to fight through the rest of the war with the, with the 12th Virginia. And he's, he's left another well-known passage about how the federal dead were stripped after, after the battle of Hatcher's Run. At Appomattox, he and the last color bearer, who, the, the man William Crawford Smith on the cover of the book, on the 12, my book on the 12th Virginia, they tore up the flag rather than surrender it. And Phillips took a star. And the inscription that he put on it reads, because I, I was lucky enough to find his granddaughter who lived in Arlington Heights, Illinois. And when I would go up to court at the Rolling Meadows Courthouse in uh, Rolling Meadows, Illinois, uh, Arlington Heights is nearby. And one time I managed to meet with his daughter and get a picture of Phillips's flag fragment, the, the remains of the star he tore from the battle flag of the 12th Virginia Infantry, the last battle flag. And his inscription reads, this portion of a star is the center of a star from the battle flag of the 12th Virginia Infantry, which I, with my own hands, tore up at Appomattox when we surrendered on the 9th of April, 1865. I divided it out to those who wished a portion of it. I have cut off four of the points from time to time, one piece to D.M. Dunlop, that's Don C. Dunlop, who was a, a character, he didn't leave many writings, but he, f he f figured in the writings of many other soldiers, some comic, some not so comic. One to Leroy S. Edwards. Well, Leroy Summerfield Edwards was a significant writer, not one of the top five, but one of the top ten. He left a big letter collection and others wrote Phillips, I also have my sword, which I had on, and the dirt has never been wiped off since I returned. <clears throat> oh, yes. Okay, now we're going to finish up with John F. Sale. John F. Sale belonged to the Company H, which was the Norfolk, the Norfolk Juniors. Now, the Norfolk Juniors originally belonged to the 6th Virginia, but they 
found their way into the 12th Virginia in Confederate service by, by about July 1861. Sale was a Norfolk man, so he didn't leave many, too many letters from early in the war, but the farther he got, when, when Norfolk was abandoned, he wrote to his aunt and uncle back in Norfolk and left a pile of of records of letters probably an inch and a half or two inches thick <clears throat> and then in 1864 he kept a diary he started keeping a diary <clears throat> he was wounded at the battle of malvern hill and the 12th virginia was on the far right of the army of northern virginia at that battle it started out behind wright's brigade but by the by the end of the battle, it was as close to the federal formation as, as any other unit. Sale was wounded at the Battle of Malvern Hill, but not very seriously because he participated in the rest of the fighting in 1862. By the end of 1862, he left this sketch of the battle flag of the 12th Virginia Infantry. He had Seven Pines, French's Farm, Malvern Hill, Manassas, Crampton Gap, Crampton's Gap, Sharpsburg, and Fredericksburg inscribed on it. And he left a wonderful passage about how the troops referred to one another by their unit. In other words, within the brigade, he he was 12th Virginia. And uh, within the regiment, he was Norfolk Juniors. And he would describe how the men would admire a really torn up flag with lots of bullet holes in it. He, part he didn't participate in the Battle of the Crater. He was sick that day. And he went on to, uh, in the fall of 1864, uh, there were men coming from Norfolk to, to join the Confederate units. And he wrote, wrote he left uh, a record of an encounter. 35 or 40 men came through enemy lines in the fall of 1864 to join the Confederate ranks. Many from Norfolk. There, the Federals had declared that everyone between the ages of 16 and 55, male or female, must take the oath of loyalty to the United States by September 15th or be sent be beyond Yankee lines. The refugees from Norfolk included someone Sale knew. Sale was sitting by a campfire with his head in his hands, lost in thought, when a youth touched him on the shoulder. Well, what will you have, so asked Sale. The youth did not answer. Sale looked up and saw a stranger in a civilian suit. Sale bade him good day. Don't you know me? The youth asked. No, said Sale. Though he suspected his visitor was someone from Norfolk by his clothes. Sale looked straight into his eyes and saw two big tears well up and roll down. Then Sale saw it was his cousin Charlie. Sale recalled, How on earth I did not recognize him, I do not understand. And hardened as I am, I thought I was. The sight of one who I loved so much brought me very near to tears. Maybe I did wipe one or two away. Had I all Norfolk to pick from, I should least have expected him. He was so backward and was so much loved by his mother and father that great indeed must be their love for their country to offer their heart's greatest treasure on its altar. Charlie wished to join the army. Sale insisted that Charlie should wait at least until next spring. Charlie wanted to stay with Sale. It took two days, but Sale finally persuaded his cousin that he was unfit for a soldier's duties. Disappointed, Charlie departed for Richmond, where other relatives found him a post in the transportation department. 
God grant the war may end before he becomes old enough to take part in it, wrote Sale. Sale also participated in the Battle of Hatcher's Run on February 6, 1865. Like George Bernard, he was wounded in the battle. Unlike Bernard, Sale was mortally wounded. He took a bullet broke his arm, went into his side, and burrowed into his liver. A mini broke his right arm, passed through his right lung, and lodged in his bowels, engendering the peritonitis that the doctors of those days, in the absence of antibiotics, could not cure. Cousin Charlie traveled from Richmond to visit Sale at the Fairground Hospital on February 11th. Charlie found Sale suffering terribly. Next day, a Roman Catholic priest administered the last sacrament, then Sale died. Before nightfall, the juniors accompanied his remains to Petersburg's Catholic Cemetery. And a marker is, is in Norfolk for Sale, where his body was removed after the war. So there's, those are the five most prolific writers of the 12th Virginia Infantry, the Petersburg Regiment. It's a fine list for the Army Historical Foundation's Distinguished Writing Award for Unit Histories. Uh, the award comes out in a couple of months, so we'll see. But it was a it was a pleasure pleasure to write the book because there was so much literature available on it. It I I consider myself more of a compiler and editor than a writer because the soldiers wrote the book. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thanks for having me.